<laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the 2013 Emily Dickinson Lecture in American Poetry, featuring poet Richard Blanco. Uh, it's exciting to see such a full house primed for poetry. Today, Richard said, it's perfect weather for poetry. <laughs> uh, not rainy enough to keep people from coming, but just rainy enough to make them feel like they don't want to go do something else. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, we'd like to begin by thanking George and Barbara Kelly for their continuing support of the Emily Dickinson Lectureship. <laughs> Additional thanks go to the Mary E. Rowling Endowment, the Joseph L. Grucci Poetry Endowment, Penn State's Department of English, the College of Liberal Arts, and the University Libraries. Finally, thanks to Richard Blanco for coming to Penn State for this visit. We'll have time for questions after Richard's reading, as well as book sale and signing. Uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And now, um, allow me to turn the podium over to Penn State professor and poet Robin Becker, who will introduce Richard Blanco. <coughs> As soon as I silence myself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. In a world of 24-hour news cycles and increasingly specialized knowledge, we look to poets to show us that engaging and thoughtful reflection still remains central to our humanity. Beyond news flashes and sound bites, poets take us into a different public sphere, bring us into conversation about topics of genuine public interest, even offer us a kind of public wisdom. Tonight we welcome to Penn State poet Richard Blanco, whose poems, richly intimate, rooted in his Cuban-American familial history, invite a social discourse, meditating on what it means to be a human being alive at this moment in history. In our reading of the poems in Looking for the Gulf Motel, my students and I tackled the complex mix of humor and gravity, shame and pride, inherited and created identities that undergird Blanco's work. He invites his readers into shared moments of consciousness, of awareness built from carefully chosen details, and then he allows the feelings and senses to shimmer, to take over. For example, in a poem titled El Florida Room, the poet gives us a catalog of memories room with the prettiest view of the lipstick red hibiscus, where I watched creature feature as a boy clinging to my brother safe from vampires, where I fell in love with Clint Eastwood, where my mother learned to dance alone as she swept, and I learned salsa pressed against my Tia Julia's enormous breast. By the end of the poem, we understand that the El Florida Room is a memory palace, an organizing principle, a literal and metaphorical space where the speaker learns to befriend his past. And his readers, to them, he poses this question. What fissures open to images that open to feelings? that open to poems in your own lives. When asked why President Barack Obama chose Richard Blanco as his inaugural poet, a committee spokesperson told the New York Times that Obama chose Blanco because his deeply personal poems are rooted in the idea of what it means to be an American. Blanco 
the gay son of Cuban exiles, is the fifth person to be chosen to write an inaugural poem, and the youngest ever to be given that honor. Previous inaugural poets include Robert Frost, Maya Angelou, and Elizabeth Alexander, another esteemed former visitor to Penn State. Trained as a civil engineer in the design of public works, Blanco brings a deep understanding of structure to his poems. Readers will see his engineer's education in meticulously crafted poems that bridge, distribute, and support the weight of his material. For example, phrasal and syntactical repetition undergird his four, five, and six line stanzas. A villanelle and pantoum show Blanco wrestling with the prosodic constraints that obsessive forms demand. These four lines come from the villanelle love poem according to quantum theory. According to theory, there's another who's growing younger as I grow older, who'll remember what I'll forget soon, every word, every poem, every letter. Though Blanco may evoke in his quantum theory poem a multiverse of independent parallel universes, his imagery and language always include and welcome his readers. To calls that poetry does not speak to contemporary audiences, I like to think of the Merrill Auditorium in Portland, Maine, originally known as the Portland City Hall Auditorium, almost filled to its 1,900 person capacity for a poetry reading by Richard Blanco. The official biography. Blanco's first book, City of a Hundred Fires, received the Agnes Starrett Poetry Prize from the University of Pittsburgh Press. His second book, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, won the Beyond Margins Award from the Penn American Center. His third, you see a pattern here, every book has won a prize. His third, Looking for the Gulf Motel, won the Patterson Poetry Prize, the Maine Literary Poetry Award, and the Tom Gunn Award from the Publishing Triangle. He has recently published two commemorative chapbooks, one today and Boston Strong with the University of Pittsburgh Press. Richard Blanco has been featured on CBS Sunday Morning, National Public Radio's All Things Considered, and Fresh Air with Terry Gross. He has read his work at conferences and venues including the Miami Book Fair, the Southern Writers Conference, the Sunken Garden Poetry Festival, the Dodge Poetry Festival, and the Poetry Center at Smith College. Major media from around the U.S. and the world, CNN, Telemundo, Anderson Cooper 360, BBC, Univision, all have interviewed him. I'll conclude this introduction with a five-line excerpt from Blanco's inaugural poem, One Today. Silver trucks heavy with oil or paper, bricks or milk teeming over highways alongside us, on our way to clean tables, read ledgers or save lives, to teach geometry or ring up groceries as my mother did for 20 years so I could write this poem. Thank you, Richard, for writing this poem and many others. Please join me in welcoming Richard Blanco to Penn State. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here um, in such a fabled, fabled institution. Um, 
Um, I apologize for the suit and jacket, but ever, I feel like men in black, but um, <laughs> ever since the inauguration, I feel like I've got to wear a tie to, wear, to, to read a poem. So um, anyway, it, again, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Robert, for that wonderful introduction and, and saves me a lot of, a lot of time, actually, but, um, in terms of setting some things up for you. Um, I'd like to begin with a, with a little bit of a, a little bit of a sticker, a little, a little bit of a phrase that I always say is the, that I was made in Cuba. Uh, assembled in Spain and imported to the United States. And what that means was that my mother left seven months pregnant uh, from Cuba with me, and I was born in Madrid, and 45 days later we left uh, to, uh, emigrated once again to the United States, to New York, and eventually Miami. Um, so by the time I was 45 days old, uh, I was figuratively a citizen of three different countries. Wow. Uh, my baby picture, my newborn picture, was actually my green card photo. And I, one would like to think that you make this stuff up, but um, it's, it's, as they say, truth is stranger than fiction. It was, a, it was a great sort of irony or foreshadowing of, of the things that would obsess my work and my life and, and everything about me, eventually. Um, this whole idea of belonging, of where, where am I from, where do I belong, am I Cuban, am I American, am I both, am I neither? And, but really, if you stop to think about those words, or those questions, they're really asking one universal thing, which is, who am I? Um, and the questions that, that no matter if you were born in the same, in the same town where your great-grandparents were born, your great-great-great-grandparents were born, there is always this sense of, well, I don't really belong in the college town, or not, I'm a New York City, City girl, or a New York City boy, or an L.A. person. It's a perpetual sort of human question. Where do we belong? Who do, what is home? Is that big, big word. And that's basically what my work is sort of trying to key into, of course, within my particular story. And though, again, again, that story, although that story is very audio, autobiographically centered, again, it is, it is universal in a way because of those questions. But it's also something else that I want to hear the students, I want to give to the students here today. It's, it's, this idea that, and I, and I think Robin mentioned this um, in one of the articles, um, this idea that I, I look at the poem as a mirror. It's, it, the poem is a mirror in which I and the reader or the listener are standing side by side and looking into. Really, the idea is that someone is reading or listening to my poem, but they're also looking and listening to their own lives. And my life is blurred with theirs. And that is the real sort of magic of art, right? It's this, this irony of art. In, the, in, in a way that, that art, my job is to tell my most important, honest, particular story about my life and at the same time transcend that and understand that my life, whatever my experiences are through art, are really an archetype for some larger understanding of us all as humans, as the basic human condition. So whether you were born in Cuba or assembled in Spain or wherever you were <laughs> put together, I hope that uh, you can stand uh, in front of the mirror and see yourselves here tonight. I always like to begin with this poem because, again, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, my very first assignment in my very first graduate writing course uh, was we read some Whitman and some Ginsberg uh, and some Frost and Campbell McGrath said, here's your poem assignment. He said, write a poem about America. <laughs> And as I look back now, I was like, that's the same poem Obama told me to write. So um, <laughs> when I first got the call, I must confess that I was a, a, a little cocky, actually. <laughs> America, I got this one. I've been writing about America for 25 years now, in that sense, of course, from a whole different, not a, not a whole different perspective, in another context. But nonetheless, that was my first assignment. And the poem is called America. So I'd love, love to start with this one as sort of a bookend of, of the inaugural poem, which I'll end with. Um, you should know three things for this poem. One is um, Cubans, and I think Latinos in general, never got Thanksgiving. Um, we call it <laughs> San Giving, as in San Pedro or San Ignacio. Um, and um, for Cubans, pork is not the other white meat. Remember that commercial? <laughs> It is the only me. <laughs> and there's a line here uh, that refers to Kennedy and from my community that I don't think the White House ever got wind of. Um, 
and the fact that I was named after Richard Nixon. So our Secret Service is not doing such a great job these days. <laughs> anyway, here's a poem. Um, and it's, of course, a childhood sort of perspective. And it's kind of a, a, I always like to begin with something that's a little on the fun side. America. Although Dia Medium boasted she discovered at least half a dozen uses for peanut butter, topping for guava shells and syrup, butter substitute for Cuban toast, hair conditioner, and relaxer, <laughs> Mama never knew what to make of the monthly five-pound jars handed out by the immigration department until my friend Jeff mentioned jelly. Hmm. But there was always pork, though. For every birthday and wedding, whole ones on Christmas and New Year's Eve's, even on Thanksgiving Day, pork, fried, broiled, or crispy skin roasted, as well as cauldrons of black beans, fried plantain tips, and yuca con mojito. These items required a special visit to Antonio's Mercado on the corner of 8th Street, where men in Guara Guayaveras stood in Senate, blaming Kennedy for everything. Ese hijo de puta. <laughs> the bile of Cuban coffee and cigar residue filling the creases of their wrinkled lips, clinging to one another's lies of lost wealth, ashamed and empty as hollow trees. By seven, I had grown suspicious. We were still here. Overheard conversations about returning to Cuba had grown wistful and less frequent. I spoke English. My parents didn't. We didn't live in a two-story house with a maid or a wood panel station wagon on a vacation camping in Colorado. None of the girls in my family had hair of gold. None of my brothers or cousins were named Greg, Peter, or Marsha. <laughs> we were not the Brady Bunch. None of the black and white characters on Donna Reed or the Dick Van Dyke show were named Guadalupe, Lazaro, or Mercedes. <laughs> Patty Duke's family wasn't like us either. They didn't have pork on Thanksgiving. They ate turkey with cranberry sauce. They didn't have yuca. They had yams, like the diddles of pilgrims I colored in class. Hmm. So, about a week before Thanksgiving, I explained to my abuelita about the Indians and the Mayflower, how Lincoln set the slaves free. I explained to my parents about the Purple Mountain's majesty, won it by land, to it by sea, the cherry tree, the tea party, the amber waves of grain, the masses yearning to be free, liberty and justice for all, until finally they agreed. This Thanksgiving, we would have turkey, <laughs> as well as pork. <laughs> Abuelita prepared the poor fowl as if committing an act of treason, <laughs> faking her enthusiasm for my sake. Mama set a frozen pumping, pumpkin pie in the oven and prepared candied yams following the instructions I had to translate from the marshmallow bag. <laughs> the table was arrayed with gladiolus. The platter turkey loomed at the center on plastic silver from Woolworths. Everyone sat in green velvet chairs we had upholstered with clear vinyl, except Tio Carlos and Toti seated in the folding chairs from the Salvation Army. I uttered a bilingual blessing and the turkey was passed around like a game of Russian roulette. <laughs> <laughs> Dry, Dioberto complained, and proceeded to drown the lean slices with pork fat drippings <laughs> and cranberry jelly, esa mierda roja, as he called it. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish speakers in the audience, apparently. <laughs> Faces fell when Mama presented her ochre pie. Pumpkin, calabaza, was a home remedy for ulcers, not a dessert. <laughs> yeah, Maria made three rounds of Cuban coffee, then Abuelo and Pepe cleared the living furniture, put in a Celia Cruz LP, and the entire family began to merengue over the linoleum of our apartment, sweating rum and coffee. Until they remembered, it was 1970 and 46 degrees in America. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
forgot to mention one of the things that was particular about growing up in Miami, and, and I, you see this in this poem, is that um, I grew up between two imaginary worlds. One was the 1950s and 60s Cuba of my parents. There were these stories and this nostalgia and photos and letters that were still coming. And not much like all of our parents, but you know that story of where I walked uphill nine miles in the snow. <laughs> well, this was Cuba, only the sort of in the opposite spectrum, like everything was better in Cuba. The mangoes were sweeter, the sugar was sweeter. It was this paradise that we were going back to some day, so don't get comfortable. Um, and then the other imaginary world, which isn't so obvious, is because I grew up in a very, in a very monolithic Cuban community. I mean, I, I was telling earlier the class, I was fascinated with Lucy's red hair because I hadn't seen somebody with red hair till I think I was in my mid twenties. So uh, I grew up amongst Cubans. So America to me was really what I saw on TV and in picture books from grade school. And I really believe that the Brady Bunch, as you saw in this poem, really existed. I actually still have plans of the Brady Bunch house on my computer that I will build someday. Um, so it was this other imaginary world in Miami and the, the, way, the place I grew up in was sort of navigating between these two imaginary worlds. You know, the, the, and Miami felt like kind of a cultural purgatory, waiting to go to Cuba or waiting to come to America, one of the two. But it's a navigation that sort of, that sort of be has become an obsession and a theme in my life in many, in many more ways than just cultural, and I'll get to some of those poems later, but in the sense of, of navigation through sexual identity and artistic identity as an engineer and a poet. Anyway, um, this is uh, another one of those where you see little Ricky, <clears throat> which might be the name of my, of my memoir next year, but Q-U-I, little Ricky. Um, you see little Ricky sort of caught in between those two worlds and yearning for one thing and trying to understand what the hell these, my crazy Cuban family is doing watching the Miss America pageant, which is one of the most bizarre memories in my, in, in my childhood. And this is what happened. And I wrote it because I, I still don't understand it, but at least the poem made me get a, little, get a little more of a glimpse to it. Betting on America. My grandmother was the bookie. She sat up at the kitchen table that night, her hair in curlers, pencil and pad, jotting down two dollar bets, paying five to one on which Miss would take the crown that year. <laughs> Abuelo put all his money on Miss Wyoming. She's got great teeth, he pronounced. <laughs> As if complimenting a horse, not her smile filling the camera before she whisked away like a cloud in a creamy chiffon dress. I dug up enough change from the sofa and car seats to bet on Miss Wisconsin, thinking I was as American as she because I was as blonde as she was. And I knew that's where all the cheese came from. <laughs> and that wasn't all. All the chocolate was from Miss Pennsylvania. The capital of Miss Montana was Helena, Mount Rushmore was in Miss South Dakota, and I knew how to say Miss Connecticut. <laughs> Unlike my Tia Gloria, who just pointed at the TV, Esa, Esa, that one, claiming she had her same figure before leaving Cuba. <laughs> it's true, es verdad, mijo. I have pictures, <laughs> she declared, before cramming another bocadito sandwich into her mouth. <laughs> Papa refused to bet on any of the misses because Americanas all have skinny butts, he complained. <laughs> There's nothing like a big culo cubano. <laughs> that needs no translation. <laughs> and everyone agreed. Es verdad, es verdad. Except for me and my little cousin Julito, who apparently was a breast man at age five, <laughs> reaching for Miss Alabama's bosom on the screen, the leggy mulatta sashaying in pumps and swimsuits, seducing Tio Pedro into picking her as the sure winner. She's the one. Parece cubana. She looks cubana, he swore. And she did. But she cost him five bucks. <laughs> Cojones! He exploded as confetti rained down. Burt Parks leading Miss Ohio, the new Miss America, by the hand to the runway. Mm. Oh, gloves up to her elbows, velvet down to her feet, 
crying diamonds into her bouquet, the queen of our country, of our land of the free, amid the purple mountains of her majesty, floating across the stage and our living room, though no one bet on her. <laughs> and none of us, not even me, could answer Mama when she asked us, Chico, where, donde esta Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> Same question I got when I moved to Maine. <laughs> For Cubans, the United States is very weird shape. You know those maps where New York is bloated yeah. and like, well for them it's Miami, it's like this big, and then the United States sort of stops at Union City in Jersey. That's <laughs> <laughs> where all the Cubans are. <laughs> um, so obviously those are fun poems, those are poems. I think when we begin writing, um, and even, even that last poem actually was in my third book, you still have these flashbacks of these childhood memories that you're like, it's like, and, you know, recovering Cuban group, it's like you just have this PTSD <laughs> sort of thing, and you think, I'm done with writing about this, these family things, but you're not. But of course, those are from childhood memories, and they take the tone and, and, the, and the point of view of the childhood, uh, of the child speaking, which is a tricky thing to do. But obviously, that, that whole milieu, that whole navigation is something that continues and colored my life, and it's colored every single poem probably I've ever written. And these, uh, this poem in particular, um, is a, is it has a whole different tone, and part of it was to ask where you're from is to ask, well, where are your parents from? And so that was the next sort of exploration. And for that question, in, with respect to my mother, is especially important. My mother left every single relative in Cuba. Every single, and, and you know, when I say that to a Cuban, that means every aunt, every uncle, every niece, every nephew, every cousin, every single re living relative that she knew for the sake of following uh, my father and for having a better life for my brother and I. And I had never quite contextualized that. I, I knew, I always in my her courage, understood her longing, understood her suffering. But it wasn't until the inauguration that I never understood the faith that that took in this country. That, that ideal that was probably nothing more in her head than pages from a glossy drugstore magazine or whatnot. And so, and so she's become, she's taught me so much about Cuba and in this last this, this latest phase of my life, she's taught me so much about being an American. Wow. And, it's, and it's pretty, the third poem of the three inaugurals was, was written to her. Anyway, this is a lot, a lot earlier poem, but it's one of those poems in which, um, for some of you uh, in, in, uh, students here, um, and if you haven't had this moment yet where you suddenly look at your parents and realize, oh my God, they're not aliens, <laughs> you know, that you finally see the humanity in your, poem, in your parents, if it hasn't happened yet, it'll probably happen pretty soon. Uh, but this was one of those moments where I finally realized, my mother's always been my mother, but I finally realized she was human. And all that hurt, and all that longing, and all that suffering, and she didn't have any answers any better than I did. And she was just trying to make the best if she could, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And that moment happened for me while watching her at a small... Cuban bodega, a grocery store, small Cuban store. Mother picking produce. She scratches the oranges, then smells the peel, presses an avocado just enough to judge its ripeness. Polishes the Macintoshes, searching for bruises. She selects with hands that have thickened, fingers that have swollen with history around the white gold of a wedding ring she now wears as a widow. Unlike the archived photos of young slender digits captive around black and white orange blossoms, her spotted hands now reach into the colors. I see all the folklore of her childhood. The fields, the fruit she once picked from the very tree, the wiry roots she pulled out of the very ground. And now, among collapsed boxes of yucca, 
through crumbling pyramids of golden mangoes, she moves with the same instinct and skill. This is how she survives death and her son on these humble duties that will never change, on those habits of living that keep a life a life. She holds up red grapes to ask me what I think, and what I think is this, a new poem about her. The grapes look like dusty rubies in her hands. But what I say is this. They look sweet, Mama. Part of the continuing that negotiation, I'll give you a really brief where the some of my friends call me, where the hell is Carmen San Diego? They kind of can't keep track of how many places I've moved to. But it's always been on this idea of finding that home, right? That, that place, that longing, that empty space. So uh, I eventually went to Cuba. Cuba was an amazing experience. I don't mean to rush through this, but at the end of the day, it wasn't that imaginary world. I couldn't re really live that, and I couldn't live there legally anyway. So that was like, okay. Check that off the list, off the bucket list. Not that I still don't go to Cuba every three, four years, but because I got to check in and make sure I keep my Cuban license active. Um, but the other piece of it is then I moved to New England. Finally, I took when I took my first per, uh, professorship at University of uh, uh, Central State Connecticut, Central Connecticut State University, and I was like, mm, Richard, we're finally going to America. You know, sleigh rides in the snow. <laughs> I think I had come out by then, so I was like arts and crafts in Westport with Martha Stewart every Tuesday. <laughs> you name it, we were poor. I had never even, I didn't, hadn't even gone on a plane until I was like 25. So we, we really lived a culturally sheltered life. I really thought that I was going into some, some TV show. And that didn't happen. Um, um, the, it wasn't the look to be 30, single, and gay in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so I said, all right. I went all over Europe. I was like, maybe I should live in Venice. Maybe I should live in, uh, in, in Barcelona. I went, maybe I should live in Guatemala. And I did for a year. Maybe I should live in Brazil. Maybe I should move to Sao Paulo. And it's this a perpetual human quest, right? Where, you know when you go on vacation and you have that travel bug and you start looking at those real estate ads? Yeah. Oh, look, honey, we, like, the, the, it's so affordable to live here. And your mind goes crazy for about five minutes, and then you go have lunch. Um, <laughs> so I said, all right, Richard, you can't live. There's no real Cuba. There's no real America. What are we going to do now? We can't live outside of you know, the rest of the world. I still felt somewhat like my country was my country. And so I said, let me go back to Miami. Let me go back to South Florida, thinking this is the only place that understands this animal named Richard Blanco, a place that even today sort of is still in between those two imaginary worlds, right? Yeah. And that didn't quite work out um, in the sense of that old adage that you can't go back home. Um, and that's what this poem was about. Um, and this poem started the third collection. Just a little more background on this. I took my partner Mark to Marco Island. Again, you can't make this stuff up. Um, and it was a place we used to vacation as children a lot. A poor man's vacation, you'd spend like a week for 50 bucks in the middle of, of summer in July in South Florida, baked to death. <laughs> Air conditioner was always on the fritz. Um, and I just wanted to take Mark to take that, you know, that proverbial uh, trip down memory lane and show him where I lived and where I played, I mean, not where I lived, but where I played in the sand, et cetera. And of course, like everything in South Florida, everything changes every five minutes, it's like a revolving door of buildings. And I was horrified, I was petrified, I was like, most the idea of being of your life being erased from the landscape, and this gets into a little bit about engineering. Uh, be, behind every physical landscape, there's really a ghost of an emotional landscape. And when that building's gone, or that that ice cream shop, or that thing, there's an incredible sort of thing that happens to us as humans. We're not prepared for that. <laughs> and so um, I wrote this poem in response to that. But what I've been feeling or been uh, understanding as I've read this poem throughout the country <clears throat> in the last few months. Everybody has their own golf motel. Everybody has that place that nobody should mess with. And this is my, in, in some ways, 
Marco Island became my Cuba, as my parents would complain about how things have changed in Cuba. So this is it, looking for the Gulf Motel. There should be nothing here I don't remember. The Gulf Motel with mermaid lampposts and ship's wheel in the lobby should still be rising out of the sand like a cake decoration. My brother and I should still be pretending we don't know our parents, embarrassing us as they roll the luggage cart past the front desk, loaded with our scruffy suitcases, two dozen loaves of Cuban bread, brown bags bulging with enough mangoes to last the entire week, our espresso pot, the pressure cooker, and a pork roast reeking garlic through the marble lobby. <laughs> All because, mijo, we can't afford to eat out. Not even on vacation. Only two hours away from our home in Miami, but far enough to be thrilled by the wider sands on the west coast of Florida, where I should still be for the first time watching the sunset instead of rise over the ocean. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My mother should still be in the kitchenette of the Gulf Motel, her daisy sandals from Kmart squeaking across the linoleum, still gorgeous in her teal swimsuit and amber earrings, stirring a pot of arroz con pollo, adding sprinkles of onion powder and dollops of tomato sauce. My father should still be in a terry cloth jacket, smoking, clinking a glass of amber whiskey in the sunset at the Gulf Motel, watching us dive into the pool, two boys he'll never see grow into men who will be proud of him. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother and I should still be playing Parcheesi. My father should still be alive, slow dancing with my mother on the sliding glass balcony of the Gulf Motel. No music, only the waves keeping time. A song only their minds hear 10,000 nights back to their life in Cuba. My mother's face should still be resting against his bare chest, like the moon resting on the sea and the stars. The stars should still be turning around them. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother should still be 13, stinking rum in the bathroom, sculpting naked women from sand. And I, I should still be eight years old, dazzled by seashells and how many seconds I can hold my breath underwater. But I'm not. I'm 38, driving up Collier Boulevard, looking for the Gulf Motel, for everything that should still be, but isn't. I want to blame the condos, their shadows for ruining the beach and my past. I want to chase the snowbirds away with their tacky McMansions and yachts. I want to turn the golf courses back into mangroves. I want to find the Gulf Motel, exactly as it was, and pretend Pretend, for just a moment, that nothing I've lost is lost. There are some places that have remained constant, fortunately. One of those is the beach, the sea. Um, I have a minute after that one. Um, it's really interesting because 
wonderful thing about art, and I guess poetry, is that every time you read something, you inhabit that emotional space again. That's like a little jarring. But um, anyway, um, there is, th this poem was partly inspired by a quote by Pascal, who, apart from because he's Pascal and I'm an engineer, um, <laughs> fascinates me. Um, it's, it's something like, uh, the sole cause of a man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his room. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that, uh, that's part of the inspiration behind the Florida Room that Robin had mentioned, and also this poem, um, though this is not a room, but it is one of those places that, that I feel that, that I could be born and die in, and, and it's always a constant, and, and for me that was the beach, which luckily they haven't changed. The buildings have changed, but, um, and what I love, what I think about this poem too in terms of the power of nature, that nature in some ways is that ultimate home, that universal home. That nature, when you approach a building or a landscape, a physical landscape, a man-made landscape, we've been complaining about the building in the English department <laughs> and the renovations that are coming and all this stuff. Anything that's man-made could always be something else. There, you could always say, well, this could be this shape or that shape. But when you look at nature, it comes on its own terms. It doesn't matter what, it, nature doesn't really care what you think about it. <laughs> Whether you think it's beautiful or ugly, it comes on its own terms and you're not going to do anything about it. Anyway, uh, I'm getting a little, a little didactic here, but this is the sea for me. Place I always return to. Some days, the sea. The sea is never the same twice. Today, the waves open their lion's mouths, hungry for the shore, and I feel the earth helpless. Some days, their foamy edges are lace at my feet, the sea a sheet of green silk. Sometimes the shore brings souvenirs from a storm, as if spoils of seagrass find a broken finger of coral, a torn fan, examine a sponge's hollow throat, Watch a man of war die a sapphire in the sand. Some days there's nothing but sand, quiet as snow. And I walk, eyes on the wind, sometimes laden with silver tasting salt, sometimes still as the sun. Some days, sometimes the sun is a dollop of honey and raining light on the sea, glinting diamond dust. Sometimes there are only clouds, clouds. Sometimes as solid as continents drifting across the sky. Other times wispy white roses that swirl into tigers, that swirl into cathedrals, into my hands. And I remember some days I am still a boy on this beach wanting to catch a seagull, cup a tiny silver fish in my hands, build a perfect sandcastle. Some days I'm a teenager blind to death, even as I watch waves seep into nothingness. Some days I'm a man, tired of being a man sleeping in the care of dusk's slanted light, or a man scared of being a man, seeing some god in the moonlight streaming over the sea. Some days I imagine myself walking the shore with feet as worn as driftwood, old and afraid of my body. Someday, I'll, I suppose I'll return someplace, like waves trickling through the sand, back to the sea, without any memory of being here. But, but, if I could choose my eternity, it would be here, aging with the moon, Enduring in the space between every grain of sand and in the cusp of every wave and every seashell's hollow. So another kind of navigation that isn't uh,
did a couple of poems on the Buddha. <laughs> was uh, something I didn't really think about to this third book, but it was a, the navigation of gender, or I should say, navigation of sexuality and gender. I hadn't really ever come out in my writing uh, because, in some ways, I felt so you're gay, so what? What's the story? And um, I realized that in this third book, I, that there was something to me that was, how do you contextualize sexuality in terms of a, of a story? And for me, this idea of cultural sexuality came to mind. So it's not the same thing to be a fat Cuban gay kid growing up behind a bowling alley in a suburb of Miami. That's not the same story as an Asian American gay kid who grew up behind a dry cleaner in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, I became fascinated because I finally said, well, I have a story to tell about my sexuality. Enter my grandmother, who's the poster child for that story, um, who was as xenophobic as she was homophobic. I'm not sure which was worse. So that anything that was culturally odd to her was also queer. Was so, and we're not talking. We're talking things like Fruit Loops, um, Plato. Anything she was in English was queer. Cub Scouts, queer. <laughs> so um, I finally found a. a uh, a place to, from which to tell that story. And I'm really interested because the, that intersection of, 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 you know, the machismo and, and Latino culture and sexuality, but also, as you'll see later, my choices as being an engineer also reflect into those complexities. We're not, we don't, we're not one day Cuban, one day gay, one day an engineer, one day an normal <laughs> poet. Those all things happen all at the same time. And we negotiate our lives in those complexities constantly, whether we acknowledge that or not. And and anyway, so this is part of what, what, my, what came out of that in this third book. And this, this is a poem told in my grandmother's voice so she could incriminate herself. <laughs> and the first time I read it, I thought it was a scathing poem. I was telling the class, and then people started chuckling, and then laughing, and then I was laughing. And I just thought, what a bitch. I can't even get back at her, like, even in poetry. Why didn't you even start <laughs> writing poetry? Isn't that the whole point of, like, becoming a writer? So, she still comes across as somewhat loving in this poem. So, be warned. Queer theory, according to my grandmother. <laughs> Never drink your soda with a straw. Men don't use straws. Milkshakes? Maybe. Stop buying your mother's Avon catalog and the men's underwear and those Sears flyers. I've seen you. Stay out of those Tupperware parties and perfume bottles. Don't let her kiss you. She kisses you much too much. Avoid hugging men, but if you must, pat them real hard on the back. <laughs> Even if it's your father. Must you keep that cat? Hi, <laughs> mijo. Why don't you like dogs? Never play house, even if you're the husband. And quit hang hanging out with that Henry kid. He's too pale. And I don't care what you call them, those ye I Joes of his are dolls. <laughs> don't draw rainbows or flowers or sunsets. I've seen you. Don't draw at all. No coloring books either. Put away your crayons, your Play-Doh, your Legos. Where are those Hot Wheels? Your laser gun and handcuffs? Those knives I gave you for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Never fly a kite or roller skate, but light all the firecrackers you want. Kill all the lizards you can. Cut up worms. Feed them to that cat of yours. <laughs> Don't sit Indian style with your legs crossed. You're no indio. Stop click clacking your sandals. You're no Tropicana chorus girl. And for God's sake, Neil, never, ever pee sitting down. <laughs> I've seen you. <laughs> God, I remember that day. Um, <laughs> Never take a bubble bath or wash your hair because shampoo is for women. So is conditioner, so is mousse, so is hand lotion. Never file your nails or blow dry your hair. Go to the barber shop con tu abuelo. You're not unisex, are you? <laughs> Stay out of the kitchen. Los hombres don't cook. They eat. Eat anything you want, except 
deviled eggs, glow pops, croissants, bagels, maybe, <laughs> cucumber sandwiches, and esos petite fours. Don't watch Bewitched or I Dream of Genie. Don't stare at the six million dollar man. I've seen you. <laughs> Never dance alone in your room. Donna Summer, Barry Manilow, The Captain, Aunt Neil, Bette Midler, and all musicals forbidden. Posters of kittens, Star Wars, or the Eiffel Tower, forbidden. Those fancy books on architecture and art, I threw them in the trash. You can't wear cologne or puka shells, and I better not catch you in clogs. If I see you in a ponytail, I'm cutting it off. Gay? What? No, you can't pierce your ear, left or right side. I don't care. You will not look like a goddamn queer. I've seen you, <laughs> even though I know you are one. This is somewhat of a humorous poem, and um, these poems have so many, so much history. But um, so I read this poem that is sort of because my friend Spencer's like, you got to write poems about Mark. I'm like, I don't want to write about Mark's favorite. I don't want to write about Mark. He begs me. So <laughs> and I always tell Mark when I start writing poems about you, be careful me as poems come out of conflict. But anyway, uh, this. This, the, like most poems, have these, again, these sort of multiple complex genesis, genesis, right? Is that a word, genesis? Is? Mm -hmm. um, one of them is my, my dear friend Alex said, there's two kind of people in the world. There's ones that call, and there's ones that never call. Um, and you know, I guess not everybody's married in the room. <laughs> the one that always, you know, calls and says, I'm going to be late or whatnot, and the other one that just disappears. Guess who I am? I'm the one who calls. <laughs> Mark is the one who doesn't call. And so uh, this poem started as sort of a fun sort of sense of, of, of that play with that. But I also realized it was one of those moments where I realized I became my mother because she would be out in, if we were 10 minutes late past curfew, she'd be out wandering the streets in her curlers and robe like Ophelia, like <laughs> waiting, waiting for the, uh, waiting for the, for the ambulance or whatever, the police, the, you know, the fire truck. And um, I found myself in the same situation with Mark. Um, and what the other thing I want to say, this is surprising, it's the favorite, one of the favorite poems of my little town in Bethel, Maine. And which caught me by surprise because this is, a, this is about a gay relationship, right? And I realized that how I had written it in a way transcended itself, which is, I think, the magic again to art. And I have lumberjacks in like in Bethel May, read Killing Mark. That's the name of the poem. <laughs> and, and I realized at the end of the day, it was a wonderful statement about where our society is now, perhaps, because in the sense it's just about love, it's just about a relationship, a marriage. It's, it has nothing to do with in terms of, of, of the sexual the sexual component as highlighted. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so I, I thought this poem was kind of neat. What it's one of those times when the poem surprises you, it's people's responses. So we're all one of these two people, and here's Killing Mark, which is a love poem. <laughs> His plane went down over Los Angeles last week, again. <laughs> or was it Long Island? Boxer shorts, hair gel, his toothbrush washed up on the shore at New Haven, but his body never recovered. I feared. Monday, he cut off his leg chainsawing, bled to death slowly while I was shopping for a new lamp. Never heard my messages on his cell phone. Where are you? Call me. I told him to be careful. He never listens. Tonight, 15 minutes late, I'm sure he's hit a moose on Route 26. But maybe, maybe he survived. You don't have moose down here, do you? The moose is a big deal. He hit a moose on Route 26. But maybe, maybe he survived. Someone from the hospital will call me, give me his room number, I'll bring his pajamas, some magazines. 525, still no phone call. Voicemail full. I turn on the news. 
wait for the report, <laughs> flashes of moose blood, his car mangled, as I buzz around the bedroom dusting the furniture and sorting the sock drawer again. Did someone knock? I'm expecting the sheriff by six o'clock. <laughs> Mr. Blanco. <laughs> That's really the main thing is that they want to say blogger. They Mr. Blanco. I'm afraid, he'll say, hand me a Ziploc with his wallet and sunglasses, his wristwatch. I'll invite him in, make some coffee. 625, I'll have to call his mom, explain, arrange to fly the body back home. Do I have enough garbage bags for his clothes? I should keep his ties, but his shoes? Order flowers, red or white roses, which were his favorite. By 7.30, I'm taking mental notes for his eulogy. <laughs> Suddenly adoring all I've hated, ten years worth of nose hairs in the sink, of lost car keys, of chewing like a cow, and hogging the bed sheets. When suddenly Joey, our dog, yowls, ears to the sound of footsteps up the drive and darts to the doorway, I follow with a scowl. Where the hell were you? <laughs> Couldn't call, of course. Translation, I die each time I kill you. <laughs> He doesn't like when I read that one. <laughs> that, one that one went up on Maria Shriver's site, and Maria Shriver dug into like, yeah, you know, men never call, and like, <laughs> he was so upset. That's like, well, I'm sorry, like, I told you that's a poem. Uh, anyway, uh, one last poem before the inaugural poem, and I think we'll be okay on time. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, okay. Uh, this one, just to bring in a little bit of the engineering, which is another navigation for me. Um, Long story, but basically I want to tell you a few things. One is, um, I went into, engin into poetry because of engineering in this, in this manner. When I graduated from engineering and started working in a consulting office, there was a lot of writing involved. And I started, really, my work depended on writing, after all, not algebra. Um, and I just started falling in love with language and seeing that language was something that was engineered. When you start thinking about audience and tone and and diction and all this stuff, knowing that I had to write, get a permit, I'd have to write a sweet buttery letter to the permitting agent and, and, and slyly persuade why my project was, you know, how it was designed was correct. If I had to write a proposal, I had to exaggerate and I had to use hyperbole and say our firm is the best firm in this block, you know. <laughs> We've been around five years, or over five years. It's been five years in one day, but it was over five years. If I had to write a report for, uh, for, a council, for a council or a city council, I had to realize that my audience was lay people and I couldn't put technical things in there. So I had to, I had to use, I had to not dumb it down as not fair, but the idea of using layman's terms. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I fell in love with language and realized that um, the next logical step, I just started fooling around with poetry and, and digging into poetry as a way of, of using what I had fallen in love with in another way. I was always a left brain, right brain child, though. I don't want to give this hope to every engineer. <laughs> but I was always one of those things. But the engineering was, was put as, uh, the creative side was put aside. And this is where the complexity comes in. One, you just heard my grandmother. If I would have told her I was going to study uh, art or poetry, you know what happened. Um, I was petrified of her. The other thing is, as an immigrant family, the, the, the idea of stu studying a career, it's outside of even the realm of of entertainment. Um, you were going to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, and that was it. And I chose the lesser of three evils. So <laughs> this poem, long story, um, is a conglomeration of those things. It involves my, it's a portrait of my father's relationship with me. It's also a portrait of some of the, I, at the time I wrote this, I was doing a lot of bridge design and started looking at the bridge very metaphorically. And it deals a lot with gender issues, as you'll see, that miss the, the ways that men can't communicate with each other, especially of that older generation, of which I'm guilty of too, and, and the, those impasses. And it's also, in some ways, why I became an engineer in an emotional, in a very poetic emotional way. Mm -hmm. It's called Papa's Bridge. There's a mount, there's a, a big bridge in Miami, 
that I used to go to every day on work, on the way to work. On the right side, you get this vista of all the hospitals, and call it the Civic Center. And on the, on the, I'm sorry, on the left, and on the right is this incredible vista of downtown, and, and sort of just, it's like the highest point in Miami, which isn't hard to be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the geometry of this poem. Baba's Bridge. Morning, driving west again, away from the sun rising in the slit of the rear view mirror. As I climb on slabs of concrete and steel, bent into a bridge, arcing with all its parabolic Y squared splendor. I rise to meet the shimmering faces of buildings, above treetops meshed into a calico of greens, forgetting the river below runs insists on running and moving the earth, grain by grain. And if only for a few inclined seconds every morning, I am 12 years old with my father standing at the 10th floor window of his hospital room, gazing back at the same bridge like a mammoth bone aching with the gravity of its own dense weight. The glass dosed by a tepid light, reviving the city as I watched and read his sleeping, wondering if he could even dream in such dreamless white. Was he falling? Was he flying? Was he falling? Was he flying? Who was he? Who was I underneath his eyelids, flitting like the birds across rooftops, and early stars wasting away? The rush hour cars pushing through the avenues like the tiny blood cells through his vein. The ivory spiraling down a string of clear licorice, feeding his forearm bruised pearl and lavender colors of the morning haze and the pills on his tongue. The stitches healed while the room kept sterile with the usual silence between us. For three days I served him water or juice in wilting paper cups, flipped through muted soap operas and game shows, filled out the menu cards stamped bland diet. For three nights, I wedged flat, strange pillows around his bed, his body shaped like a fallen S, mortared in place by layers of stiff percale. When he was ordered to walk, I took his hand, and together we stepped to the window and he spoke, Mijo, Mijo, someday you'll know how to build bridges like that. Today, I cross this city, this bridge again, still spanning the silent distance between us with the memory of a father and son holding hands and secretly in love. So, I'm going to read you, and we'll close on this. Very disorganized for an engineer. <laughs> Three ring binder with I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, oh my dad. Um, I I don't know if it, I've been saying, but there's a there's an account, a nonfiction account um, of a book uh, that I wrote. I don't even know how I managed to find time to write this, but I did almost because I had to. It was, like, it was just I had to do this. Of the whole inauguration, like, the whole experience as inaugural report, from the moment I get the phone call to the moment I come back to Bethel, and also a little bit of an epilogue of what's happened since then and because of that. 
Um, and so I wanted just to, it's called uh, For All of Us, One Today, an Inaugural Poet's Journey. Um, and it has the other three poems, the other two poems of the three I had the right, that haven't been ever published. But um, I will say this, that, and I'm just going to read you a little excerpt. This is one of the most beautiful moments in my life. And, um, and most unexpected, not, not just the phone call, not just the, but what, a little bit of what I'm going to give you here. Searching for home, wondering where I'm from, where do I belong, who am I, who's little Ricky? It wasn't until that day that I stood up at that podium and realized that I was home all along. Mm. And in some ways, that story that I thought, mm, I know you're not quite home as an immigrant, there's always this little tinge that says, well, you're not quite American. American is some other little kid in TV from a 1960s <laughs> film. And realizing that, that in the great spirit of what America of what America truly is, that all our stories, every single story in this room, every single story of your grandparents and your, and your great-grandparents is what America is. And I felt like kicking myself on the butt because I was like, duh, <laughs> like I never got that. <laughs> Do we behave like that every day? Are there people that don't think that way? Of course. But the important thing, and I realized on that podium, is that those ideals are palp palpable still. They're still there. And it's beautiful that we have not reached them because we get to be part of, of, of that story, of writing that story, of fighting for those to let us, as a people, reach those ideals. And um, I'm telling you all this in retrospect, but it was, it was something magical that happened. And often people wonder, how could you have done that and gotten up there with such... This is why. I'm at the podium. My mother's slapping me, <laughs> telling me to stop fidgeting and be still. She's telling me she had her same figure of, she, that she was hotter than Beyonce when she was young. <laughs> <laughs> she gives me a candy, and then she starts crying. I wish her dad was here, and then my mother. My mother at the end of the day, but anyway, she, she's standing next to me. I mean, sitting next to me. In that moment, I feel America standing as one putting differences aside, and taking a deep collective breath. We pay tribute to something far bigger and more important than any one of us, though I truly feel I am one of us, one of we the people in the echoes of Obama's and others' speeches. I embrace America in a way I never had or thought I could, feeling for the first time that I belong truly belong to one country. Not an imaginary ideal from TV or a nostalgic island floating in the sea of my parents' memories, but a real, tangible place that is mine, was mine, all along. I turn to my mother and whisper, Mama, I think we're finally Americanos. <laughs> she gives me a tender look as if saying, I know, I know. Indeed, I realized it was always one story I was born into, one story for me to discover and claim, one story to make my own. In that instant, I understand one today as a gift to America. Senator Schumer introduces me and calls me up to the podium. My mother squeezes my shoulder. I stand more confident than I imagined I would or could be, transfixed by the moment that is no longer about me or my poem or my glory, but about our country. Still, I'm surprised when the president and vice president stand up to greet me and shake my hand on my way to the podium. They both whisper something in my ear that I can't make out. <laughs> but their gracious gestures speak silently to my heart. Silently. 
as if saying, Richard, here is your country. This is your story. This is your home. I step up to the podium, look out over the crowd, a patchwork quilt of lives, of stories spread across our ground, under our sky, beneath our one sun. I take it all in as I take one deep breath, then another. This is for them. This is for us. This is for all of us, I think to myself, and begin speaking into our wind. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, America won today. One sun rose on us today, kindled over our shores, peeking over the Smokies, greeting the faces of the Great Lakes, spreading a simple truth across the Great Plains, then charging over the Rockies. One light, waking up rooftops, under each one a story told by our silent gestures, moving behind windows. My face, your face, millions of faces in morning's mirrors, each one yawning to life, crescendoing into our day, pencil yellow school buses, the rhythm of traffic lights, fruit stands, apples, limes, and oranges arrayed like rainbows begging our praise. Silver trucks, heavy with oil or paper, bricks or milk, teeming over highways alongside us, on our way to clean tables, read ledgers, or save lives, to teach geometry or ring up groceries as my mother did for 20 years so I could write this poem for us today. All of us, as vital as the one light we move through, the same light on blackboards with lessons for the day, equations to solve, history to question, or atoms imagined. The I have a dream, we keep dreaming, or the impossible vocabulary of sorrow that won't explain the empty deaths of 20 children marked absent today and forever. Many prayers, but one light, breathing color into stained glass windows, life into the faces of bronze statues, warmth onto the steps of our museums and park benches as mothers watch their children slide into the day. One ground, our ground, rooting us to every stalk of corn, every head of wheat sown by sweat and hands, hands gleaning coal or planting windmills in deserts and hilltops that keep us warm, hands digging trenches, hands routing pipes and cables, hands as worn as my father's cutting sugar cane so my brother and I could have books and shoes. The dust of our farms and deserts, our cities and plains, mingled by one wind, our breath. Breathe. Hear it through the day's gorgeous din of honking calves, buses launching down avenues, the symphony of footsteps, guitars, and screeching subways, the unexpected songbird on your clothesline. Hear squeaky playground swings, trains whistling, or whispers across cafe tables. Hear the doors we open for each other all day 
saying hello, shalom, buongiorno, howdy, namaste, or buenos dias. In the language my mother taught, in every language, spoken into one wind, carrying our lives without prejudice, as these words break from my lips. Once God, since the Appalachians and Sietas claimed their majesty, and the Mississippi and Colorado worked their way to the sea, thank the work of our hands, leaving steel, to bridges, finishing one more report for the boss on time, stitching another wound or uniform, the first brushstroke on a portrait, or the last floor on the Freedom Tower, jutting into a sky that yields to our resilience. One sky, toward which we sometimes lift our eyes, tired from work. Some days guessing at the weather of our lives. Some days giving thanks for love. Man, love that loves you back. Sometimes praising a mother who knew how to give, or forgiving a father who couldn't give what you wanted. And so we head home home, through the gloss of rain or the weight of snow or the plum blush of dust, but always, always home, always under one sky, our sky, and always one moon, like a silent drum tapping on every rooftop and every window of one country, all of us facing the stars, and hope a new constellation, waiting for us to map it, waiting for us to name it together.